Good afternoon. The meeting will now come to order. Hello, I am Marcia Herbert, President of the Board of Education. I would like to welcome you to the April 10th, 2024 board meeting. In keeping with the board's commitment to open communication with the community, this meeting is being streamed live on the CCPS website at www.carolk12.org and broadcast live on Channel 21. We are also recording this meeting so that it can be accessed on demand on our website and broadcast throughout the month on Channel 21. Public participation will be held at approximately 515. Speakers will be directed into the boardroom from the building lobby and are allotted three minutes to address the board. As a reminder, please silence all cell phones and other devices. <coughs> board members, please turn off your microphones when you're not speaking. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag and the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening, and now we need the approval of the approval of the agenda, motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. By Dr. Dorsey, seconded by? I'll second. Ms. Battaglia. Comments, questions? I call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now I need a motion for the unapproved board meeting minutes on March 8th, 2023. So moved. By Ms. Battaglia, seconded by? Savigny. Questions, comments, corrections? I call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now I need a motion for the unapproved work session minutes on student behavior on March 18th, 2024. So moved. By Ms. Dr. Dorsey, seconded by? Second. By Mr. Whistler, thank you. Comments, questions? Uh, Ms. Herbert, can you hold on one second? Sure, I'm a hold. Um, seem to I'm moving along. I as I always do. I think I might have had one comment, but sure. I seem to have misplaced my minutes, that version of the minutes in my packet. Okay, nope, I don't have it. No, I'm, okay, I'm good. Okay. Yep. I call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, it passes unanimously. And now at this time, we will have the Carroll County Student Government Report. <coughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is AJ Sebian, and I am the Vice President for CCSGA. On April 9th, CCSGA held our Executive Board meeting, where we finalized everything for our General Assembly today. We offered many different workshops regarding making presentations, choosing careers, and advocating. We also elected our board this for our next school year. And finally, on April 22nd, our Environmental Affairs Coordinator are hosting environmental advocacy panel in the evening and registration will go out soon. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much. And at this time we will have public comment. Ms. Battaglia. To have an orally presentation of comments by the public, the following guidelines apply. Speakers with a connection to CCPS will be allowed to address the board for the allotted three minutes. Only those speakers that have registered online and have been notified by the communications department will be permitted to speak priority will be given to students to those citizens that are addressing the board about an item on the current agenda citizens not appearing in person for public comment can write to the board through email or u.s mail public participation is not intended to be a question and answer session however it is if citizens have specific questions the superintendent will assign the staff member to make conduct contact during the board meeting to arrange a time to respond to questions the superintendent and the board reserve the right to correct misinformation presented as factual after the conclusion of the public participation period. Statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item, an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Personnel matters pending appeals, the actions or statements of individual staff, or items related to employee negotiations are not appropriate topics and may not be discussed. The board has scheduled time on the agenda for public participation at approximately 5.15.
The board reserves the right to limit the number of speakers on a particular topic so that all topics may be addressed. Additionally, the board retains the discretion to allow additional speakers as it deemed appropriate. The board is allowing no more than an hour for public participation. Comments are limited to three minutes or less. All comments should be redirected to the board members at the dais. Citizens may not address the board with their individual comments. Citizens may not stand in for another person or group and read their comments. When the allotted time expires, the speaker is permitted to complete a sentence. Citizens may leave any handouts for the board members on the table at the back of the report room. Please do not approach the dais. Additionally, the public may not display signs or posters during the board meeting. In lieu of signs or if you are unable to complete your comments in the allotted time, individuals are encouraged to submit remarks to the board in writing. Those seated in the audience are asked to be respectful of the speaker and refrain from commenting to the speaker or the board members. The first speaker is Tim Barrelheim. <coughs> I think some of the board members have met me, Ms. Battaglia, Mr. Whistler. I've spoken with you, Ms. Herbert. Yes, this sir. has to do with the ROTC program in the high schools. I understand we've been having some issues trying to get it approved. I understand that May will not ensure us, but that's really not the issue here. What we need is permission from the board to have the program for marksmanship in uh, the schools for junior ROTC. Uh, speaking with board members I spoke to, everybody was in favor of it. Uh, I really haven't gotten a lot of hard answers other than we don't can't get insurance. So I would like the board to take it up as to whether you would approve the program and we can go from there. The DOD provides, as far as I know, everything. Uh, I was hoping to have First Sergeant Soteric up here. He runs the Century program. But nobody has bothered to talk with him from the school board as to what DOD will provide for the program. So if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Bauerlein. Yes, ma'am. You've contacted staff yes, more than multiple times, mm -hmm. and we've thoroughly investigated um, this program. I can tell you that insurance is part of it. There are other obstacles for us as well, um, but we have responded to you I uh, very clearly on multiple occasions. So. One thing I would like to point out with that is if Frederick County, Anne Arundel County, Montgomery County can have this program, why can't Carroll County? There are lots of reasons, and this is not a question answer time. I understand that. But again, we've given you a clear and succinct answer to your request. Thank you. Next speaker, Greg Melville. Thank you, board members, for giving me this time to speak. Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Greg Malvo, candidate for Board of Education. Um, and as a parent, I'm deeply concerned about the rising tide of bullying and physical altercations in our schools. With over two decades of teaching experience and a PhD in education and administration, I offer, I think, a unique perspective on the issue. We're witnessing an alarming increase in physical altercations within our schools, especially among elementary schoolers. Recent data reveals a 70% surge in fights, a troubling trend that demands our immediate attention. And just last month, we heard testimonials from parents whose children are victims of school violence. I certainly don't have a one-size-fits-all solution, but I believe in uh, power of local initiatives to address this crisis. Here are some proposals. Uh, one, let's establish a local task force or forces, to, and I suggest a task force comprised of parents, teachers, and community members to address school violence. These groups can volunteer as a presence during school hours, especially in areas where supervision is lacking. 
let's increase our uh, school support staff. Invest in our educational support professionals who play a crucial role in addressing student needs, and I spoke about that actually last month. Provide better compensation and initiatives to attract staff that can help manage conflicts in hallways and cafeterias as well as schools or inside the school. Three, insist on a firm balance of discipline and restorative practices. We need more discipline and less reliance on restorative practices. Students must know that there are firm consequences for disruptive behavior. Let's ensure consistent policies across all classrooms and empower teachers to maintain order while fostering a supportive learning environment. Let's limit cell phone use. I suggest restricting cell phone use uh, so it's not, not only not in the classroom, but also hallways and lunchrooms. Let's prevent cyberbullying and coordination of fights through the digital means. Let's foster peer mentoring. Fifth, let's expand peer mentoring programs to promote positive relationships among students. We should encourage older students to mentor our younger ones and foster a sense of community and reduce conflicts. Let's maintain those resource officers, SROs. Uh, let's continue to work with our sheriff and reallocate SROs to schools with greater challenges of bullying. Let's foster community engagement. Uh, groups like the Array of Sunshine to engage with students and staff on anti-bullying and mental health initiatives. We should facilitate open discussions and forums to address underlying issues. And in conclusion, tackling bullying requires local control. I always advocate for policies, and I will, that prioritize the safety and well-being of students while fostering a culture of discipline and respect. Please finish your thought. Together we can make our schools safer and more conducive to learning. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Belinda Lawson. She's on here. Okay. And our final speaker we have is Taylor King. I am a student in Oklahoma Middle School here in Carroll County. I am here to tell my story about bullying, the bullying situation. I've been bullying relentless, relentlessly the past two months or so. Here are just a few things that happened. I've been shoved, pushed down, called vile names, and, se and had sexual comments made about my male name and to me. It has affected me that I do not feel safe in my school. I've had a pencil thrown at my eye. They make fun of my appearance and I have talked to administration school I have talked to administration and the school over and over and there's no consequences for the three students that continue to harass me almost every day. I'm a good student with good grades with goals to be Carroll County Sheriff after I graduate. I want to be I want a quality education without being bullied or distracted. I asked my bullies why they are doing this to me and they laugh. The adults in the school do nothing but they try to investigate and they that leads to more bullying because I'm a snitch for telling adults principals how much I am be I am bullying. I I am being bullied. I cannot take any more. I didn't want to go to school today and I'm scared to go tomorrow because it just makes me feel so sick. They they do so much to me, and I can't even explain in three minutes. If the administration doesn't do anything to ensure the students feel safe, then how can we learn? This isn't fair to me or anyone else that is getting bullied every day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and that concludes our um, speakers for tonight. Ms. Gramato, would you meet with uh, the student out in the lobby who just spoke? Thank you. Yes, Ms. Gramato will meet you out there in the um, foyer. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will move on to employee groups. Good evening, Superintendent McKay, board members. Um, I'm Celeste Jordan, president of CCA. 
I want to extend our thanks to the community for another great Read Across Maryland event. We gave out a little over 500 books and both children and adults had a good time. We want to give a special thanks to Pen Penguin Random House for the books. Um, the Liberty and South Carol Drama students did an awesome job with Annie and Susical. We had community partners, the Carroll County Public Library, the Judy Center, a Braille station that was manned by CCPS students, the Westminster Fire Company, I believe SWAT was there, and several of our SROs set up a table to interact with the community. I want to thank Superintendent McCabe and Case for partnering with us on this event. I want to thank all the people who read, um, Mr. Whistler was one of our readers, and the high school students who did activities with the children. I'm also going to give a shout out to Mr. Tim Norwood because his kids cook the pancakes for us, which is a tremendous help from back in the days where we had to bring it in on warming trays and, and try to do that. Um, also, Mr. Tom Riddle for hosting us at Career Tech. Uh, CCA ratified the tentative agreement and career ladder in March. This is the earliest we have ratified in anyone's memory. Both the CCPS team and the CCA team came to the table willing to exchange ideas, collaborate, and compromise to find a middle ground that we believe puts CCPS on a path to continue being a leader in the state. This shows that what we can accomplish when we work together with a spirit of collaboration and respect. Trust me that while this process was well worthwhile, it was not easy, and we should be celebrating this accomplishment. CCA has often heard from the commissioners that they wish CCA would settle before the commissioners need to determine their budget, and we did it. So I will once again say that CCA supports the superintendent's budget request, and we encourage the board of commissioners to just fund it. The career ladder must be implemented by July 1 of this year. Carol can implement the 60000 starting salary requirement a year early, which will help us recruit and hire the most qualified educators. I am hopeful we can work together to get the superintendent's budget fully funded. I know both teams are anxious to have the career ladder work group reconvene so we can keep CCPS moving forward as a leader in the state with blueprint implementation. It is what Carroll County families deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. McCabe and members of the Board of Education. I'm Cindy Porter, president of CASE, representing clericals, LPNs, and assistants across Carroll County Public Schools. As representative of a bargaining unit of education support professionals, I have appreciated hearing supportive comments for the work of the members of our bargaining unit and have tried to provide a better lens into the value of these positions, especially because of the relationships established by our education support professional staff with the students we serve in our county. With that being said, on three different occasions over the last two months, I have listened to three different presentations, one regarding pillar three of our school system, one about an informative look into the utilization of AI in our school system moving forward, and last month, a presentation on the current student personal technology policy. None of these presentations included education support professionals as stakeholders. I and other education support professionals are aware that the blueprint for Maryland's future is laden with benchmarks and timelines with emphasis on the certificated members of our school system. That emphasis is also evident in objectives one and two of our own pillar three. Objective one states that CCPS recruits qualified candidates for all teacher positions. Objective two states that CCPS supports staff to build the blueprint for Maryland's future career ladder. In reference to the pillar three presentation, there are staffing shortages across our entire school system. And because of the significant increases in disruptive student behavior that we have seen as a school system this year, and that I have spoken to over the past few months, I would think it would be beneficial to have an emphasis on recruiting qualified candidates for all positions in CCPS. In the presentation addressing AI in our school system, training was mentioned for teachers to support the CCPS plan. And in last month's Board of Education presentation on the current Carroll County Public Schools student personal device policy, one of the slides mentioned a committee looking at this policy comprised of several stakeholders, including administrators and certificated staff. In all instances, education support professionals were never mentioned, 
yet many times we have the closest interaction with students on a daily basis and have important and pertinent knowledge on these issues. As an employee and mother of former students in our school system, I am glad that CCPS is looking proactively on how to address the proper utilization of AI in our schools. And training is an essential component in being successful in this arena. But training education support professionals is as important as training teachers. Many times it is the instructional assistants, paraprofessionals, and student support assistants who are either helping students individually or in small groups or monitoring students to assist a teacher in a classroom. I do want to mention and show my appreciation to Mr. Wernick as he took time to engage in dialogue with me when I asked if case bargaining unit members could be trained as well as the present in, in the presentation I attended. Case bargaining unit members are also at the forefront of knowing what's going on with student personal devices in our schools. Our security assistants, lab assistants, instructional assistants, paraprofessionals, and student support assistants see students hiding their personal devices on their person behind computer screens or in desks. They are aware of students utilizing their devices during opportunities they are given at the secondary level to make up work with students choosing to instead use the time to get on their devices to schedule meetings with friends and significant others or to watch the latest viral video as examples. And our clerical staff is even told by elementary students that they're going to be parent pickup or that mom, dad, or someone else will be coming to pick them up because of contacting family on their devices and vice versa, many times because the students decide they don't want to be in school. There are several important issues impacting our school system now and in the years to come. Education support professionals can bring practical insights and valuable in input to these situations, policies, and discussions, and can help to bridge the gap between policy formulation and implementation because of our positions. Our school system has a valuable resource at its fingertips, which could help to provide a more comprehensive and consistent approach to and application of policies and procedures to help give our students more opportunities to be successful. Inclusion of education support professionals in discussions at these levels is important and something that I hope will be considered moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will start with Mr. Whistler with res recognitions and his activities and correspondence. Thank you, Madam President. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, April 21st through 27th is Administrative Professionals Week, and Wednesday, April 24th, is Administrative Professionals Day. Thanks so much to our clericals, secretaries, and administrative assistants, both in our schools and here at Central Office. These dedicated and caring employees are so essential to the daily operation of our schools and offices. They assist our students, staff, and the public in countless ways and play a vital role in their schools and our entire school system. All right, do you want to do your correspondence? Do my correspondence? Certainly. Yeah, we'll do it all. All right. Well, I, I have quite a bit. Um, on March 18th, I participated in the student behavior work session alongside my colleagues and staff. While I deeply respect the premise and processes behind our federal and state laws, um, I find personally that we must find a way to assert local control and ensure students respect the rules, one another, and the notion that they will face appropriate and swift disciplinary measures if they disrupt instruction or threaten others. Our teachers, parents, and students are counting on us to find meaningful ways to uh, correct the situations very quickly. On March 20th, I attended the Chamber of Commerce Teacher of the Year Awards at Winters Mill High, alongside my colleagues. Uh, I'm very grateful for our business community, uh, working with our neighbors and our parents to recognize and celebrate 787 members of our teaching staff. Uh, on March 21st, I conducted mock interviews with students at FSK High School in Tawnytown. Many thanks to Principal Mobley and Ms. Jenny Adcock for coordinating the event and preparing our students to enter the workforce. On March 22nd, I served as a judge at the Linton Springs Elementary STEM Fair. There were hundreds of entries this year, and I was really impressed uh, at the quality of the projects for elementary school students. I really love these fairs because they not only spark learning, 
But these projects help bring families together when moms, dads, siblings, and the students collaborate to create the finished product. Later that evening on March 22nd, I stopped by Century High School to see our middle school students from all over the county compete in the Battle of the Books. I want to thank our public library system for coordinating these very important events. Carroll County excels academically because educators, librarians, and parents collaborate to make learning fun. On March 23rd, I had the opportunity to read uh, to students at the Read Across a Maryland event at the Career and Tech Center. It was so nice seeing so many educators, students, and parents attend the event. I really appreciate the invitation by our CCEA leadership to uh, read, so thank you so much. On April 9th, I attended the grand opening of the Boys and Girls Club's North Carroll Clubhouse at the formal North Carroll High School. I appreciate the generosity of so many in our community, including the Collert Foundation, Mr. and Mrs. Tevis, Con Creative in Westminster, Lowe's, and so many more business groups who uh, helped transform an empty space into something that's incredibly fantastic for kids. I look forward to see seeing phase two at the facility when um, we received the 1.4 million federal earmark to create one of the best boys and girls clubs technology centers on the East Coast. I also want to express my sincere appreciation for our state delegates, uh, senators, and so many parents who worked tirelessly during the legislative session in Annapolis. They were so instrumental in defeating House Bill 558, which would have removed a parent's ability to opt their child out of controversial aspects of the health framework. They also helped preserve local control and amend troubling provisions in the Freedom to Read Act. Their efforts helped preserve our policy that restricts a minor's access to supplemental materials with inappropriate content and instead require a parent's permission for checkout. And finally, I am wearing purple today, at least my wife tells me I am since I'm colorblind. Um, being a military retiree from the Navy, uh, April 15th, um, April is the month of the military child, if you didn't know, and on April 15th is Purple Up. And so um, we, we, we call it Purple Up because uh, in the military, it suits all of the branches of the service with... Um, Air Force being blue, Army being green, Navy is blue, Marine red, and the Coast Guard blue. So um, I'm here to honor all of our military kids and teaching uh, professionals and staff members in our schools. We, I think Carol has the ninth largest amount of uh, military retirees and active duty people in the state. So thank you so much to our military kids and our military professionals for making learning so important here in Carroll County. Thank you. Dr. Dorsey. Okay, thank you very much. I have a couple of designations for the month. Um, National School Library Media Month. April is National School Library Media Month. Our media specialists teach students how to locate and use information through both traditional resources and new technologies and instill the love of reading for a lifetime. Thanks to these dedicated employees for making our school media centers a welcoming place for students to learn and have fun. Next, National Student Leadership Week. April 24th through 30th is National Student Leadership Week. This annual recognition highlights the important role that student leaders play in our schools and in the community. We are very fortunate to have a very strong and active student government association that gives students an opportunity to voice their opinions and develop their leadership skills. The board would like to thank Sahithya Sudakar, our student representative, and Flamato Fofana, president of the CCSGA, for their outstanding leadership and the excellent job they do representing our students. And now for my activities on March 15th, um, we had our Equity Council meeting. We continued discussing objectives related to equity in Carroll County Public Schools. I, again, appreciate Dr. Moore and thank her for planning and implementing or facilitating the meeting for us. On March 18th, we had our work session on student behavior. March 20th, I participated in virtual mock interviews 
Thanks to Melinda Ditson, Career Connections Coordinator at Century High School, for giving me the opportunity to interview eight students. This provided practice for the students and an opportunity for me to hear their plans and goals for the future. And it was so exciting to hear them share. And that evening, I also attended the Carroll County Outstanding Teacher Awards. And it's always an honor to recognize this year's Chamber of Commer Commerce Scholarship recipients, outstanding teacher nominees, and the outstanding teacher finalists. We know that teaching continues to be challenging, but thankfully, it can also be very rewarding. It was good to shed a positive light on the profession and to thank and congratulate the honorees for this year. Schools were well represented that evening, and I know that for all the teachers who are there, there were many more back um, in their homes who are also excelling in the profession. I'd like to congratulate again those who were recognized and thanks to the Chamber of Commerce for continuing to make these awards possible. We thank the executive sponsor and all of the premier corporate business and PTA sponsors. On March 26th, I attended a MABE Equity Committee workshop, and during this workshop, we discussed practical ways to implement the equity policy in our local jurisdictions. And finally, what an, ex what an inspiring day I enjoyed on yesterday. My day began at Sykesville Middle School. I had been invited to be the guest speaker to kick off their Unity Day. I was greeted by staff members who all wore special t-shirts displaying Kindness Matters, which was the focus of the Unity Day. Throughout the day, students were involved in special activities. So our thanks to Mrs. Whitlow and her team and to the students and staff for this special day. And later in the day, I also attended the ribbon cutting ceremony for the new Boys and Girls Club at the former North Carroll High School. And it's a wonderful facility, and I just think of, of the wonderful opportunity um, that's going to be provided to the students um, in that community who are going to be a part of that new club. The facility is really beautiful and very functional, and each room just has its own theme, and each room sort of comes alive, and I can only imagine how much livelier it will be when all of the students um, actually get there and attend. Um, so again, it was a very inspiring day on yesterday. Thank so you. Thank you. Ms. Battaglia. This week is National Assistant Principals Week. Our assistant principals work hard making sure that our schools run safely and effectively and our, stu our students excel academically and socially. Our teachers grow professionally and our families and community members become involved and stay engaged in the education of our students. Thanks to all our assistant principals for all their outstanding work and their leadership. Lunch, School Lunch Hero Day will be observed on Friday, February 3rd. Uh, May 3rd, I don't know why I said February, oh my gosh, May 3rd. <laughs> this day is an opportunity for students and parents and school staff to thank and work for their hardworking uh, school food service workers. We appreciate this dedicated employees who do whatever it takes to provide our students with healthy meals each and every school day and for making students feel welcome in our schools and our cafeterias. And my activities. Um, so on May 18th, uh, I had attended the behavior, uh, behavior work session we had here in the office. March 20th was the Teacher of the Year Awards, um, which I always love that event because I, I can't thank our teachers enough for everything that they do. March 25th was the uh, town hall that our superintendent held at the Career and Technology Center. On April 4th, I attended the Tournament of Champions at McDaniel College, and that was such an amazing event. And I have to brag about Miss Marsha. Um, if anybody remembers the parachute when you're in elementary school, yeah, Miss Marsha had to participate in that one. <laughs> yes, I did. Brought back memories. And I ran in, and I ran out, and I didn't fall. Yep. And I wanted to get on the little scooters. Like, the kids were on the little scooters. I was like, oh, I remember that. But it was, it was really cool to see those kids participate and just how happy they were to be included in, in those activities. On April 5th, I attended the Battle of the Books at Manchester Valley High School, and I want to congratulate 
every team that was involved from um, all the different elementary schools in the Manchester and Hampstead area, and congratulations to the winners. And I'm so thankful for the partnership that we have with our public library um, system here in Carroll County, that what they do with those students. Those kids, uh, it, it's just so much fun. Um, just the questions that are asked and the no matter whether the students get the question wrong or right, like they all cheer for each other. And it's just so great to see all the kids come together and just have a good time. On April 7th, I attended the Empty Bowls fundraiser that was held at the St. John's um, here in Westminster. And this fundraiser is for Shepherd staff. This is the first time I've ever attended. And it was such an amazing event. Like I, I, I felt like I was in Epcot almost where you can eat around the world. Like, there was so much soup, so many different foods. It was so good. And I really, I left there full. It was just, it was a great fundraiser. So I'm just thankful for everybody who participated and who donated and contributed to that fundraiser for uh, Shepherd staff. Um, yesterday, April 9th, I attended the Boys and Girls Club ribbon cutting ceremony at the Old North Carroll High School. Um, that was really nice to see. That was the second time we've been there. And, I mean, it, it, it's going to be an incredible place once everything is said and done. Last night, I attended the Carroll County 4-H Achievement Program at the Ag Center. And let me tell you, these kids, they, they work so hard all year long. It's not just when it's getting ready for fair time. The, the work that they put into everything all year long, whether it's their project records, whether it's their, their learning service hours, these kids work really hard, and so I just want to congratulate all the volunteers that help those kids out, all the 4-Hers that participate, um, those who help out the 4-Hers in participating. It, it's an incredible um, you know, organization we have here in the county. And speaking of 4-H, uh, sign-ups are coming up due, and um, projects are kick-starting. I currently have a lamb and a goat at my house, and it's rather noisy lately. That's a new one for us. <laughs> um, I want to say good luck to all the students participating in Skills USA this weekend, um, all the students participating in drama productions in the coming weeks, and all students participating in orchestra and band concerts and spring sports. Like, good luck to all of you. Like, we have some amazing talent in this county, and we are, I know I'm incredibly proud of them. I know I think we all are incredibly proud of our students and what they do. And, and how they shine. So I just want to say good luck to all of them in all their activities. We are finally in the final stretch of our school year. Um, again, lots of things coming up, so I, I hope we can finish the school year really strong and um, just keep on going. And I know my kids, I'm looking forward to their report cards coming home. They're not, but I am. <laughs> um, so just for fun, today is National Siblings Day. Uh, I have one sibling, so I know my sister never really watches, but hey, sis. Um, I'm really proud of her and everything that she has accomplished lately. But, you know, some of us are lucky to have one or more siblings, and some of us don't have siblings. Um, I have a couple friends, you know, and they, they struggle with that, but they always have, like, friends who are, like, siblings. But I think um, we all can appreciate having siblings in our lives and having those family ties. Um, I think that's it. All right. Thank you. Ms. Battaglia. Oh, Ms. Savigny. <laughs> Sorry, she went on so long. I was like, uh, Thank <laughs> you. that's okay. I'm trying to move the meeting along and get finished by 630. That's not going to happen now, folks. <laughs> I tried. Thanks, Ms. Herbert. Sure. So I do have one announcement. It is a Public School <coughs> Volunteer Week will be celebrated during the week of April 15th through 19th. And from tutoring and mentoring to chaperoning field trips and assisting in the classroom, volunteers play a crucial role in supporting the success of students and teachers. We truly appreciate the efforts of these dedicated individuals who do so much to support our schools, our students, and our staff. And as for uh, my activities, um, I'll keep it short and sweet, Mr. <laughs> Herbert. Um, it's all right. So several of them have already been mentioned. Uh, right. First was the student behavior work session. Mm -hmm. um, I do just want to thank staff for the very informative meeting. Um, I think it was really good. The, the information that was shared, the discussion that was had um, was very informative. I don't want to lose sight of some of the follow-ups that we have mm -hmm. from that work session, um, and one of them being you know, to follow up with the delegates, um, hopefully sometime over the summer, since they were not able to attend that session, yes. even though they were 
very interested in it, but it happened to be right towards the end of session. So um, looking forward to those uh, discussion, the further discussions. Um, the Outstanding Teachers Award Ceremony, um, always a fun event and, you know, an honor to be there and looking forward to being able to announce some winners uh, in the near future here in our boardroom. Um, as far as the Battle of the Books, um, I do have a couple upcoming uh, in the next week that I'm scheduled to go to. And uh, last year, I was able to share the MC duties with Mr. Shockney uh, for, for one of the Battle of the Books. And I recall there was an inordinate number of questions regarding poop. So I'm curious <laughs> to see what the subject of many of the questions are this year. Yes. So can't wait. Yes, yes, there we go. It, it was a, it's yeah. always such a fun night and great to see kids just absolutely loving and having such a fun time with reading and books. Um, I, I also uh, I have a graduating senior this year, so activities have just been ramped up unbelievably. So, so um, looking forward to the the graduation ceremonies and all the all the fun things that start happening this this time of year. Although a lot of them are going to be the 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 last <laughs> of you know those type of activities. So I'll try to try to not get all verklempt um, at some of those. Um, and the last thing is the joint meeting with uh, the commissioners. I just want to thank the commissioners for continuing our tradition. I think that's something that we started, I want to say, 2018, meeting quarterly with the commissioners. And it really has paid huge benefits um, to, I think, the entire county um, with the transparent and open discussions that we had. So I think, you know, we all... We, are, we weren't all necessarily of the same opinion earlier today, but we had very respectful discussions and I think we all understand each other's opinions even if, if we may not completely agree with them so I think that you know continue to have those great discussions very transparent and we're gonna find a way to make this work right so um, with that I will thank you hand it over to Sai. good evening everyone um I'd like to thank Dr. Dorsey for her kind words me and the CCA CCSGA president deeply appreciate it um so I recently attended the March 18th student um, work behavior work session. Um, it was very informative and we got to learn a lot more stuff. Um, I had also attended the Liberty High School Culture Fest on March 21st, which had displayed some beautiful performances, exposed a lot of cultures, and we learned a lot of new things about that. Um, something else that I did that was very exciting was from April 1st to 5th, I was in Annapolis serving my last week as a page and coincidentally the last week of the legislative session as a whole. It was an incredible opportunity to serve and assist the House of Delegates during the session and upcoming seniors be on the lookout for becoming a page. I have a little medallion to show my mm -hmm. fun that I had for the General Assembly that week. I had also attended Signy Dine which is the very last day of the General Assembly, featuring lots of confetti and um, much more fun, um, along with getting home at 3 a.m. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know about that one. But <laughs> yesterday on April 9th, we held the CCSGA officer meeting in which we discussed our General Assembly and which occurred earlier today at Westminster High School. We held an election for the upcoming school year's CCSGA officers who had given some incredible speeches. Thank you so much to dedicated SGA students who had attended. I also attended the joint meeting earlier today, which was incredibly informative. I'd like to congratulate Jasmina Musa Vea, who will be the student representative for the 2025 to 2026 school year. I am so excited for the future students who are passionate to get involved. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, we're going to do something a little different again. It recently came uh, to my attention that a lot of the community members are not aware of what really corollary sports are. And it really came up when they, they were talking about bus fees and things like that. It's a wonderful program that is a school system we're very proud to offer to our students. And I saw this in action myself. During the winter season, CETV. TV Channel 21 had the opportunity to visit two bowling lanes to see the program in action. We have a little short video that will give you a glimpse of the program and shows you just how engaged our students are. And if you're interested, they're going to do a longer version and will be able to be accessed at CCPS YouTube channel. Take it away.
Our corollary program provides the opportunity for students with disabilities as well as students without disabilities to participate in an athletics program that better meets their needs. It allows our students to represent their school, to wear the school uniform, to have the school's name emblazoned across their chest and be a part of a program as they improve relationships and their athletic skills in a competitive environment. It's a really nice mix because we have our special ed kids that get a chance, their opportunity to, to participate, and then we have our general ed kids that are really good supports for them and like they're really great, encouraging, very encouraging, great cheerleaders for them. Whether it's one pin knocked down or a strike, there's always that level of cheering and excitement, and that's just something that I think everyone in the county regardless JV, varsity, corollary sports could learn from. Being able to work with these kids has been very rewarding. Like it's by far one of the best coaching jobs that anybody could have. Their happiness is infectious. So now I just wanted you all to see what actually goes on in corollary sports and we have a, a champion here, Miss Celeste Jordan, had two county champs at bocce ball, so, <laughs> <laughs> so hey, two, not one, but two. But, you know, it, look, that program's great, and that was some of the best seven years that I spent. Yeah, it, they're wonderful, and they're so appreciative. They mm -hmm. really are. And I just have two other comments. Um, I want to thank the commissioners today. That was a great meeting. Uh, it was two hours, and it was full of... Um, talking back and forth, and I, we really need to do this. I will be looking forward. Uh, we will have our next meeting in July. Uh, Andy's already talked to me about it, mm -hmm. and it'll be um, over at their house. But we have to work together with this budget. We have unfunded mandates. They have unfunded EMS and other things in the sheriff, and they've got some big ticket items, and they're, we're all going to have to work together. and. Uh, work this out and uh, I really want to thank uh, personally thank the delegation for all their hard work this session uh, it wasn't easy they're always knocked down and out but there were two bills that were specifically targeted uh, to the CCPS uh, school system and I'm gonna be an old mother hen right now and she doesn't know I'm gonna say this but I am so just sit there and just hold tight because <laughs> I will protect her. I, I think she is doing a fantastic job. Uh, one in particular was directed at our superintendent, Dr. Cindy McKay, and the executive director of the Carroll County Public School System went to Annapolis to promote, to promote the passing of this bill. That bill passed, and you all have no idea how this will affect. Yes, library. for the library system. And um, it is a shame that this will uh, affect CCPS for many, many years to come, parents and students alike for the, uh, for the, for the library bill. So, but I just wanted to take up for Dr. McKay because um, we all have to stick together. And uh, it was very unfortunate, but we are behind you all the way, ma'am. And thank you. And now it's your turn. Well, I'd like to begin by uh, echoing the board members' uh, thanks to the um, commissioners for today's joint meeting. I thought it was great conversation and great problem solving together, and I think we do that well. Um, and I think we're a model for other counties in that way. So thank you, as well as a thank you to our, our delegates who have just been through um, a challenging uh, general assembly season. So uh, I wanted to thank them for all their work as well. And next, I'd like to congratulate the 787 teachers who were recognized in the 35th Annual Outstanding Teacher Awards Program. A special congratulations goes to eight teachers who received Outstanding Teacher Awards. They are Annie Cumberland, Library Media at Manchester Elementary School, Amy Glasscock, fifth grade humanities at Winfield Elementary, Todd Hartshorn, social studies at Manchester Valley High, Nicole Hunsicker, kindergarten at Runnymede Elementary, Katie Wraith, mathematics at North Carroll Middle, Frank Reaver, CTE and visual arts at Century High, 
Ashley Sevick, social studies teacher um, at Shiloh Middle School. And finally, Brian Thompson, instrumental and general vocal music at Westminster Elementary. The Carroll County Teacher of the Year will be chosen from among these eight outstanding teachers. The Teacher of the Year will be announced at our employee recognition ceremony on Wednesday, April 24th. On behalf of the school system, I would like to thank the Chamber of Commerce and all the businesses and organizations that sponsored and supported the Outstanding Teacher Awards program. Congratulations to Jamie Swartzball, a senior at Winters Mill High School who was one of the winners of the Maryland Emerging Scholars Award presented by the Maryland Business Roundtable for Education. This prestigious award recognizes 24 high school students from across Maryland, each representing their school district based on their remarkable contributions to their communities, exemplary leadership within their schools, and exceptional academic performance. Jamie actively engages in college level courses and is a member of the National Honor Society. She also extends her leadership to community service, contributing significantly to the community with over 900 service learning hours. I would also like to congratulate the 36 students from Carroll County Public Schools who received the prestigious honor of being named a Carson Scholar. Students are selected as Carson Scholars for demonstrating outstanding academic achievement and significant humanitarian qualities. First-time scholars are awarded a $1,000 college scholarship, an Olympic-sized medal, and a certificate. In addition, 137 of our students have renewed their Carson Scholar status. These previous scholarship recipients have maintained high academic standards and a strong commitment to their communities. And now I would like to congratulate our winter sports athletes and coaches who won state championships. The South Carroll High School wrestling team won dual state championships for the third consecutive season, and four South Carroll students won individual championships in their weight group. South Carroll also had the champion cheerleading team. And in indoor track, a Westminster High School student won the 3A pole vault and a student from Century won the 500 meters. A team of students from Liberty High School was the state champion in the 4 by 800 relay. Congratulations to all of our state champions and good luck to all of our spring teams. And finally, and I know this is what many, many parents are waiting for this mm -hmm. evening, I would like to announce an adjustment to the last day of school. Due to the fact that two of the emergency closing days built into this year's calendar were unused, the last day of school for students will be Tuesday, June 11th, with a two-hour and 45-minute early dismissal system-wide. <laughs> and that's it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And now, at this time, we, have, we will have a presentation. Take it away, Dr. McKay. So this evening, we have a team of staff here completed by the Maryland State Department of Education. Mr. Wernick and a team of staff will present our scores. It is to be noted that our schools already have these reports and are using the data as part of their regular school improvement process. Kendra, you're a little hard on your people there. She's got a crutch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on behalf of the team, we want to bring greetings to President Herbert the board and superintendent, Dr. McCabe. I like to say both of those together. Um, thank you for having us. And we are here to identify strengths, focus areas, and next steps based on the Maryland report card and star ratings and scores. Our purpose for this presentation and review of this data is to monitor students' progress and make informed decisions. 
This first slide you've seen before, but I'm just going to give a quick summary of that paragraph up there. And what it's saying is, according to the Maryland State Department of Education, the Maryland report card is comparable to a student report card, as it describes the school's performance on the Maryland accountability system. Measurements are the same for elementary and middle schools, and you'll see that the areas that are measured are academic achievement, academic progress, English language proficiency, and school quality and student success. At the high school level, academic achievement, English language proficiency, and school quality and success are measured along with the graduation rate and readiness for post-secondary success. But please note, as you total up those scores, it may appear that a school can get 100, but that's not possible for all schools because some schools don't qualify for the English language proficiency portion because of the enrollment numbers or students who are um, eligible for it to participate in the assessment. So please keep that part in mind when you see some of the scores. We just wanted to quickly highlight some of the changes that were made to the measures. At the elementary level, the changes are student growth in mathematics and ELA. That changed from a formula to a point scale in the area of academic progress only. Um, and then when they also measured chronic absenteeism under school quality and school success, there was an in increase in the range scores. So for example, in school year 22, if you had a score anywhere between 0 and 44, you re received one point. This year, anything between 0 and 60, you receive one point. So we've had, and we continue to have conversations with MSDE to build our understanding of these changes, and some will have a negative impact on our distribution of points because of the range changes. Please keep that part in mind mm. as well. Can, yeah. on here for a second. can can I ask a question about the front, the formula to the point scale? Um, what exactly did the, I, I, can you remind me what that meant? Because that seemed to have a significant impact on a lot of our scoring. It did, and we don't have a clear understanding. Again, we've been working with MSD to build our understanding as well. We do have our own little cheat sheets that we have here, and we, we will be more than willing to share that with you and have some conversations with you about that. Um, but there was a conversion from a point score to a for, from a formula to a point score it's complicated <laughs> <laughs> that was a good answer okay. did anybody have anything they wanted to add do you under, understand a little more we're on the same calls but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll add something um okay, so break, you'll add. so basically msd has communicated to us that they've used pre-pandemic measures and so when they gave us the 2019 guidelines for the most part, it did match except for some areas such as social studies in middle school. So it's supposed to better reflect pre-pandemic measures. Um, however, there are some elements of it that we still don't understand. Yeah, I was, I mean, and, and I can save this for some of the, the chart comparisons later on, but I mean, it seemed like for student achievement, most of the scores went up, but at the same time, the student progress, most of the scores went down, right? So it didn't, it doesn't seem like there was a good translation. Um, I mean. And I'll say correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Yes. So there's I was understanding some, there, it correctly. There are some questions and some discrepancies from school to school within districts. Um, it's not just here, it's everywhere for the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And again, we participate in weekly meetings and everybody is trying to build an understanding of how these scores are actually converted and what does it mean when it was a formula compared to a point system. So, so there's lots of questions and they are doing their best to try to get um, some responses for all of us. Okay. So that we can build our understanding. As we build our understanding, we'll try to share that information with you as much as possible. Okay, that's great. Because I, when you look at this, it, you immediately think, oh, wow, we actually went down in score at a lot of our schools. But it's really driven by that one measure. And it's really inconsistent. Like, so I'm just trying to understand, like, okay, it's not really real. It, it doesn't feel real that we had a, a decrease in score for a lot of our schools if they can't explain the difference in the translation from that formula to the to point scale. So I appreciate that. Comment. And even as something as simple as the range score changes, you're no longer comparing apples to apples because you still don't fall within those ranges that you did before. Because before, if you had a 55, you might have received two or three points. Where now, mm -hmm. that because of that up to 60 range, you only receive one point. So things like that um, have an impact on the total score that a, student, a school receives. Okay. And it makes me wonder, as a math junkie and a statistical you know, nerd, if they're doing this to to 
bring in the standard deviation so that some school systems like us don't stand out more than others? Are they doing it to kind of bring everybody to the middle so they don't look as bad at the bottom? Or that just really makes me wonder if that's what they're doing. Because it does, it does shorten that standard deviation and it makes everybody come to the middle and it will bring those at the bottom up and it will bring those at the top like us down. So it just makes me wonder if this is a statistical game that's being played downtown to make everybody look a little better. She can't answer that. I, and I understand that, but again, I'm just thinking out loud. <laughs> I'm taking just, off Don't feel the need to. Oh, don't, don't, don't. I just, um, I just it, again, it, it, it really makes me think, why are they doing this um, down at Central Office? Because, again, it makes us look a little worse than we truly are. And at the same time, it will bring those at the bottom a little up to make them look like they're doing better. So that's my personal opinion, and, and I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah. Thank you. And not close the gap. You got to bring the bottom up. You know, I'm, that's another jargon from the state that drives me crazy. And that's exactly what this looks like. And I'm not a fan of this five star anyway. And they've all know that from the state. So. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I'm just telling you, just telling you my thoughts, my heartfelt feelings. It's the truth. Okay. We're going to move on to the middle school measures. <laughs> and with that said, those areas are highlighted as well. The change, and again, it was from a formula to a point scale in growth in ELA and mathematics, as well as an increase in the range scores when we're measuring chronic absenteeism. In addition, the percentage of students scoring proficient on the social studies eighth grade MCAT was included in the measurement for completion of a well-rounded curriculum. The possible points increased from 6.5 to 10. Next we have the high schools and overall the high school measures remain the same as you can see with the exception of the range point scale increased for chronic absenteeism in the area of school quality and student success. Dr. Hart, could, could I ask one other question about the, the English language proficiency where it says that it's they're going to attain it within six years how, why is six years kind of the delineation that they use for all of those measures? And, and how do you determine whether someone is going to be proficient within six years on like a projection kind of basis? I'm just trying to understand like how, how that's utilized. We don't want to look unprepared up here, but we yeah, have the same questions. No, these are great questions, but I'm glad that you have these questions because these are some of the same questions. You see the looks like, oh my, I knew that was going to be asked. Um, we kind of have the same questions. And again, we all are trying to build an understanding um, to be able to respond when people have questions for us because we know after these ratings are shared and different information is disseminated, we're going to have questions and right now we aren't prepared to answer those questions and I only can be transparent with you to tell you we had the same question because in the six years, if you're measuring high school, most likely you won't be in high school for six years. Right. And so how, was, how was, does that take place? Um, so again, we're trying to build our understanding and hopefully we can come back to you with an answer for that. Okay, appreciate that, thank you. And as I always have to say, some parts are subjective. And that gives a false narrative. And I am very proud of our schools here in Carroll County. We are as well, thank you. <laughs> you can go ahead and drop your mic. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, but it's the truth. Um, mm. So I just wanted to give some highlights for the Maryland report card. Um, the first part, as you heard, the student growth measurements for elementary and middle school ELA and math have changed from a formula to a point scale. There was a point scale range increase for chronic absenteeism. Eighth grade social studies MCAP scores were added when determining well-rounded curriculum, resulting in a possible points increase. There's a variation in points possible that a school can earn, and this is based on the area of English language proficiency, as we discussed, because of the demographics of the enrollment and participation in assessments. Um, we just want to give a quick update that the school survey is currently open, and it's open until April 19th, and the data from the current session will be used for the next school year. And I just want to give a huge thank you and shout out to our school principals and assistant principals and the administration who collaborates with us to make sure that these surveys actually take place and people get a chance to participate in those. So thank you so much for them. And then next, Mr. Yerdahl and Ms. Hill will share information on star ratings.
So looking at star rating comparison for all Carroll County schools from 2022 to 2023, we see some results impacted by changes made to the Maryland report card uh, from the previous year to this year. Many of our star ratings decreased from our elementary and middle schools, while two high schools decreased in star ratings from a star rating five to a four. Amongst our total schools, we see an increase in three star schools from five to 12, an increase in four star schools from 19 to 24, and a decrease in five star schools from 10, I'm sorry, from 12 to one. This bar graph compares 2022 and 2023 elementary school star ratings with the green bars representing the school year 2022 and the blue bars representing school year 2023. Due to Maryland report card measurement changes, only one elementary school maintained a five star school rating as opposed to 10 schools the previous year. Our highest performing school performed better than 94% of Maryland schools, while our lowest performing school performed better than 34% of Maryland schools. This chart represents how our elementary schools performed as a county in each indicator, with an overall performance of a 67.5 out of 100 compared to last year, which was a 75.6. Even though we performed slightly higher in areas of academic achievement and progress in achieving English language proficiency, we lost points in areas of academic progress and school quality and student success. This chart shows individual elementary school report card scores by indicator when compared to the 2022 school year. And here we can see how the 2023 measurement changes take effect in academic progress and school quality and student success for every school there. We, we also have four additional schools that have scores for progress in achieving English language proficiency due to the increase of English learners that have taken the English langu language proficiency assessment. This raises the total possible points, as Dr. Hart had mentioned, uh, from 90 points to 100. Due partially to these changes, all elementary schools have decreased in overall percentage that impacts star ratings. And Mr. Yerdahl, um, uh, back on, on that page, that, that was what I was kind of referring to, where like, if you're looking at the elementary schools, the academic achievement went up in most instances, or it either stayed level or went up. Um, but then the academic progress went down in almost every single one of those categories, and that just doesn't seem to translate well. Um, do, we, do we have a feel for if we had maintained the academic progress rating from last year, if that would have kept most of our, our school ratings at the same level that they had been at last year? Most likely not. Um, looking at uh, the point range scale. I think a good example is in order to get seven points in 2022, you needed at least a 63%. But this past year, 2023, you need a 74% to get the same number of points. So more than likely, we, we would have had raised significantly in that category. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. To summarize elementary school report card ratings, we saw a decrease in five-star schools while an increase in the number of three and four-star schools. Four additional schools also measured for an additional 10 points in English language proficiency, and schools decreased in points for indicators, as we mentioned, academic progress in school quality and student success. Overall, elementary schools scored uh, earned 67.5 points compared to 75.6 points in 2022. Ms. Hill will now share our middle school and high school report card results. Thank you, Chris. So our first chart uh, is a bar graph comparing our 2022 and 2023 middle school star ratings. Um, to kind of put this in perspective for you, there was only one middle school in the entire state of Maryland that achieved a five-star rating. So um, this is mainly due to those standards reverting back to the pre-pandemic measurements. Um, so our highest performing middle school did perform better than 90% of Maryland schools, and our lowest performing middle school performed better than 53% of Maryland schools. So this chart is going to show us how middle schools performed overall in each indicator. Carroll County had an overall performance of 57.2 in 2023 as compared to 62.7 in 2022. 
Uh, if you look at the academic progress indicator, it, you can see it now includes the MCAP Social Studies 8 assessment scores. And our middle schools did increase in academic achievement, but they did earn lower scores in academic progress, progress in achieving English language proficiency, and school quality and success. And then if we look at each middle school's performance within each of the indicators, you can see the 2023 measurement changes take effect in both academic progress and school quality and student success. Um, we did have one additional school um, earn points in the progress in achieving English language proficiency, which did raise that particular school's point value from 90 to 100. And all middle schools did decrease in overall percentage, which is reflected in their star ratings. <clears throat> so to summarize, there was a decrease in star ratings for middle school. Uh, two of the methods for calculating the indicator points did change, and those indicators are where we noticed the most significant changes overall in scores for 2023. And the overall score for middle schools did decrease to 57.2 in 2023. So moving on to our high schools, um, this bar graph should look familiar. It is comparing the 22-23 high school star ratings. Um, two of our previous five-star schools did decrease in rating, while one three-star school did increase. So when comparing the middle school and the high school criteria, um, you will notice that the high schools experienced the least amount of measurement changes. Our highest performing high school did perform better than 92% of Maryland schools, and our lowest performing high school performed better than 52% of Maryland schools. And in this chart, we can see how each of our high school, I'm sorry, how the high schools performed overall in each of the indicators. Um, Carroll County High Schools did have an overall performance of 62.2, which matched their rating in 2022. Our schools did increase in progress in achieving English language profici proficiency. They maintained an academic achievement and readiness for post-secondary success and scored lower in graduation rate and school quality and student success. And so this chart now looks at each of the high school's performance within the indicators. Um, and you can see again the 2023 measurement changes taking effect in the school quality and student success column. We did have an additional high school qualify for points in the progress in achieving English language proficiency, which did increase that school's total possible points again from 90 to 100 points. Um, only one school increased in overall percentage, which moved that school from three stars to four stars. And it is important to note that two of the schools were rated out of 82.5 because of the smaller population size and calculating the average performance level for math. So to summarize for high schools, we did have one increase in star rating, two decreases in star rating, and the rest of our schools maintained their ratings from 2022. Half of our schools did qualify for points in progress in achieving English language proficiency, and the overall school score for high schools maintained at 62.2. So we did share um, some details in this presentation, but there is a lot more to be had on the Maryland School Report Card site. And now Mr. Wernick will discuss our next steps for the system. When we, really, when we look at next steps, it really begins as soon as the schools receive their data. So next steps really you know, is deceiving because they've already received their data and really have started with that continuous targeted improvement process. Um, that process starts at the grade level, department level, at the uh, school improvement team level of really looking at their data, analyzing their data, and then developing a needs assessment for the school. And then it moves on to really at the supervisor level, um, or at the school level to really talk about what professional learning is needed, what specific individual needs of students um, targeting um, instruction is needed. And then it moves forward into kind of monitoring that data, that constant monitoring of the data, looking back on what uh, improvements need to continue to be made, looking at our student data, um, at our local benchmark progress, and then continuously monitoring and analyzing that data uh, to ensure that we're developing those actions of needs. Mr. Warnick, when, when do the schools receive this, this information? Actually, this information came out um, in, I believe it was February, if I'm not mistaken. January, end of January, Feb uh, early February timeframe. Okay, I knew it had come out you know, prior to 
us getting it at this point um, because I saw it was available. So the schools receive it January, February, and they're able to begin. Correct. As soon as we see receive the batch file from MSDE, we then um, disaggregate it, send it out to the schools, specific schools, and then they begin looking at their data. Um, again, this is last year's data. Oh, wow. So really looking at data would be our local uh, assessments, our common assessments, or our benchmarks mm -hmm. um, to ensure that we're continuously in looking at progress across those um, measures, right. um, as well as in alignment with measures from MCAP or from uh, the STAR rating. Right. This always seems so dated when um, we do get it and when the schools can use it. And as you were sharing earlier, it looks like instead of making those comparisons, comparisons from 22 to um, 23, you know, maybe if things will remain the same, we can just sort of put 22 off to the side and um, look at 23, 24, if the same type ratings are being used. Absolutely. So thank can you. Can I ask a one, sure. one um, Mr. Warner, can you, can you help me understand, like, so we get MCAP data, right, and that goes to the schools and the school improvement teams that they use that to, to help develop their plans for, uh, you know, improving student achievement. How, how would they use this particular report to, to adjust or change what they're doing from a, from a student achievement perspective? Because it seems like this data isn't necessarily, you know, as, doesn't provide as much guidance as, say, like MCAP mm -hmm. scores or things right. like that. Absolutely. I agree with you that it's not as targeted, but I think looking overall at your school, at either your ESOL population and how they have improved, looking at the performance of your students' um, proficiency scores, and looking at how much has your students improved from one year to another, really then you can dig deeper. So they give you basic trends, and then you can begin to analyze then where do we need to go deeper within our, within our data, either the MCAP data from the, you know, the year prior, or our local uh, assessments, which really have a great correlation to how students do within the MCAP. And I, okay. I, I agree. I would just add that this is good trend data, and it also partly allows us to triangulate data a little bit better, mm -hmm. um, because if we can see um, something that's that's falling into alignment between a local assessment and MCAP and then we look at this and we see the same thing going on here it tells us that the um, that what we're doing as far as assessing where our students are and then creating um, whatever interventions we need to do for that that, that we're targeting the right areas okay. yeah okay thank you yes ma'am um, I just have a question on, um, well, I've noticed that in the past few years, the amount of English language learners have increased um, tremendously. Uh, do we have a percentage of how many students are currently English language learners at CCPS currently? I can gather that data. I don't have it in front of me, but I can uh, gather that for you. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Mr. Mr. O'Neill is he's digging feverishly digging. Because <laughs> along with that, I'd like to I'd like to see the percentage change in the past few years, mm -hmm. because we can see how much has increased, and then that way we can sort of see what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I do have that data over the last three years, so I can provide that to you because we were actually looking at that not too long ago. I just didn't bring it uh, with me. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you all for the presentation. And Mr. O'Neill. Oh, it looks like he maybe oh, found did it. Did you find anything? <laughs> really? Thank you. <laughs> Dr. McCabe had it at the agency hearing. Mm -hmm. So I don't have uh, I don't have three years, but a percentage change in the year. Well, it might be three years uh, post pandemic. Um, percentage change for Carroll is fourteen point one percent positive growth. That's fourth in the state of Maryland. Uh, and then, do we have the number of students in total? Four hundred and fifty-two listed in the state data. So this would. Basically, state data is almost always a year old, so there would be new numbers for this fall, um, which Mr. Wernig would update later. Mm, I can't exactly divide quite now. What is the percentage of that compared <laughs> to the total amount of students at CCPS? 452. I can tell you that. Versus um, 26,000. Oh. The state does that. Again, this is probably a year old, uh, but percentage of total <laughs> enrollment, um, 
1.8 percent yep. from that fiscal <laughs> year so still 21st out of 24 in the state all right but a growing population mm -hmm. out of so we're still low in to as a percentage um versus other counties but we're the fourth largest increase across in the, the state, state in our number of students this year okay I, I recall seeing that as one of the challenges on the joint commissioner um, deck right and the second largest total enrollment increase in the state since the pandemic really not very far beyond behind Frederick and there's probably some correlation there that could be teased out mm -hmm. yeah. but I don't I don't have that sir. and then speaking of the student population what's the staff population for for working with our ELL students has that increased any or but the number of ESOL staff, mm -hmm. no, that number has not increased. So it's still around. I don't have that. I, okay. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Werner, can you bail me out on that one? Or <laughs> I believe, and I could be wrong, I think it's around 20, but, but okay. uh, I, I could be wrong. I was thinking around 17. Yes, I th it's like somewhere that. around there. We okay. have some hourly as well, so I okay. think it brings up right around 20 um, okay. uh, teachers. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, and the reason I ask is because, you know, as enrollment increases, as more people move to Carroll County because of our school system, we're going to get a lot more diverse groups of students, and I do think we need to make sure that we fulfill the roles of these students and their needs. Well, the blueprint requires mm -hmm. uh, uh, that we increase the amount that we are spending on teaching and resources for, for our um, ESOL students. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this would be FTE, Dr. Dorsey, not head count, but it's about 18 FTE, so it could easily be over 20 human beings. And um, to Dr. McCabe's last point, it's about $2 million of a compliance um, uh, delta or gap on, on ESOL as or, or English learners as a category of, of blueprint funding and compliance. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Appreciate it. Can we do it in five minutes? Thank you. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> all right, and now we're going to move on to the construction report. Dr. McCabe? This is the monthly construction report. It is updated for summer projects as well. Knowing you're interested, I will say that work continues well at East Middle, but the large amounts of recent rain uh, has slowed down the work mm -hmm. toward paving. Um, any questions that you may have, Mr. Marks is here to answer. Now I know Ms. Savigny has that <laughs> yellow card up. I didn't ask any last month, Mr. Marks, so I have to ask this month. <laughs> so, um, no, it's great to hear um, that, that things are going as replanned, I guess, for, for East Middle. <laughs> um, so that's great to hear. A um, quick question about the kindergarten additions. Um, it looks like you know, some of those have been submitted, but some are, um, you know, under, after technical review, there have been some, some comments that are, that are being addressed. How, how extensive are those comments, and do you, do you see any issues coming up as part of those? No issues from what we're seeing. A lot of this, and there's so many various agencies that you're dealing with, uh, whether you're dealing with a, a, uh, a, a town's issue, whether it's just meeting, changing your, your code uh, listings to their listings instead of the county listings. Most of it's just small stuff like that. Uh, we haven't seen anything major yet. Um, and okay. so, and they, it comes back in a trickle. It doesn't always come back at once. Mm -hmm. So the technical review committee meeting we did went smooth uh, with the uh, county. Uh, the rest are mostly through the municipal uh, processes that they have like we okay. went to Tawny Towns meeting uh, a few weeks ago and there was no issues there um, so it's going well okay great so nothing that's giving you pause no okay fantastic thank yep. you sure anything else all right thank you and now we will move on to the legislative report dr. McCabe the General Assembly ended on Monday April 8th and there is still time for the dust to settle and get greater clarification on every bill. There's also a period of time for the governor to consider bills that have passed and add his signature. So for tonight, just two days after the session, Mr. O'Neill has produced a summary of the major education bills that were being tracked by Mabe and Pizam. We'll respond to any questions or discussion. I just, Mr. Whistler. Oh. I just have a comment again. Um, 
I don't know, uh, President Herbert, Mr. O'Neill, at least our, every other Mondays are going to be free. No more, no more May legislative session meetings. But again, thank you so much for advocating for our schools. Um, I know you do so much work behind the scenes helping other boards of ed, um, you know, and, and other LEAs with, I, I know they ask you how you do things here, um, but, but again, just thanks so much to our uh, legislators, but they, they work really hard to protect us and our local control. It, they really have this, this session. They, they really have worked hard, and that's why I made my comments. Anything else? All right. Could Oops. we just ask um, Mr. O'Neill, um, and there, there were a couple of bills that we were obviously looking at very closely, but is there anything on the, we, we didn't have another chance to kind of read through this, but is there anything coming out that gives you pause? Um, it, mm. it wasn't as uh, challenging a session as it sometimes is in terms of the volumes of, uh, volume of bills with, with more of a major impact on, um, on public education. Uh, the budget we, we discussed earlier, there's nothing here on your handout about the operating budget, but we made out in the operating budget fine, uh, at least no negative change. Um, the capital budget, the state seems to be holding its line at, at $450 million, which is good news in, in going forward there in the future. As far as these bills, um, we, we, you've discussed a little bit tonight earlier, the Freedom to Read Act. You know, to me, and we've asked Mr. O'Mealy for his quick analysis, that doesn't, to us, as we read it, change the policy you've enacted uh, in any way. We wouldn't anticipate any, any sort of changes there. Um, some of the other bills um, that have passed are honestly less onerous, uh, particularly I'm thinking in the realm of special education than how we've seen those bills in prior sessions. And so I guess that's good news. If it's less worse than, than things could be, um, that's usually a victory in Annapolis. And then there, there's a lot to unpack on, um, on the two blueprint bills that are here. Um, and there were many, many amendments, and uh, it's hard to get the enrolled text at this stage. So there, there just needs to be some more analysis before we talk about that. But I don't necessarily see anything immediately harming us there. Um, so all in all, it's and, and maybe this is negative, and I shouldn't even say it, but it, you know, most of us probably judge the outcome of Annapolis by how limited the damage done is, and mm -hmm. this overall wasn't wasn't a terrible session in terms of a lot of um, unfunded mandates that have to immediately be implemented. Some of these things, if you look at them, lend trend in that direction. And so, just for an example, there's a bill in here about uh, telehealth. Uh, uh, sites and so it's on page four under student health HB 522 that bill as presented would have had missed as submitted would have had Mr. Streaker and his team hopping the amendments by end of session at least for one year made it more about MSDE and MDH coming up with protocols and guidelines to properly administer mental health so next year not a lot of harm future years, Mr. Streaker and his team, I'm sure, will, and Mr. Prokop, for that matter, will be figuring out where and how to conduct mental health in our, uh, I'm sorry, telehealth, I keep saying mental health, telehealth opportunities for students in our schools. So okay. that, I don't know if that's a good assessment or not, but that's kind of where I am on it right now. Okay, great. I mean, it's good to know that there's, there's nothing that you're, I, I guess, you know, less bad than it could have been is, is, is a pretty good assessment. Yeah, I mean, I turn to Mrs. Herbert and Mr. Whistler, who are your representatives at MABE, if you feel the same or not. That's, that was yeah, no, I mean, our, um, the MABE legislative um, lobbyists did a great job kind of putting a lot of teeth out of some of these bills. Um, and there were some bills, like the last page, two seatbelt seat belt bus bills bus that bill. uh, one was a seat bus, uh, a seatbelt bus bill, and another one was a camera thing but um that those bill, those bills were passed in one house but not one chamber but not the other right. but but our, our lobbyists did a really good job in in kind of putting some of these onerous bills down or at least taking the wind out of their sails so it wouldn't be too costly or onerous on our system and mabe has to um Pazam did too Pazam did a good job there. Uh, has to say yes with so they can get a seat at the table and then take right take the teeth out of a bill right. uh, to protect us. Fable and with amendments. That, that, that happened a lot. But, uh, John, thank you. You do a great job doing this. Uh, if, in 10 seconds, Ms. Herbert, you talked so much about the reasonableness that, that we're seeing earlier mm -hmm. tonight. That's a direct reflection of our delegation, and in particular, Senator Reedy opening a, 
a dialogue with the president of the Senate early on. And so Absolutely. That be yeah. Again. We can't, I can't thank them enough. And they have a thankless job, and they're always up against the wall. Yeah, and again, I got to say, you know, there's teamwork here with the commissioners and the Board of Ed, but there's also the teamwork with the folks in Annapolis representing MACO, the lobbyists for them, the lobbyists for PAZAM, the, the, the superintendents, um, you know, the May, but, but we really do work together to, to try to massage or to, to neuter some of the content of these bills, and, and it is truly a teamwork. And, uh, but again, thanks to everybody involved. So, all right, thank you. And now we will move on to personnel transaction report. As we normally do this time of year, I bring before you my recommendations for transfers of administrators. We will continue to do the same in upcoming meetings with the goal of having all administrators in their new locations by July 1st. One transaction will be further explained later under the approval of appointments. So first we have uh, Scott Lavender, currently principal at Northwest Middle, to go to principal at East Middle. Next, Jamie Carver, principal at East Middle, to go to principal at Oklahoma Road Middle. Janelle Fosnott, principal at Oklahoma Road Middle, to principal at Shiloh Middle. Debbie Winson, principal at Mount Airy Elementary, to principal at Westminster Elementary. And finally, Whitney Warner, principal at Westminster Elementary, to principal at Ebb Valley Elementary. Thank you. Comments? Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And now I need a motion for the approval of the award of bids. So moved. By Dr. Dorsey, seconded by Awesome. Ms. Battaglia. There are seven items on the award of bids this evening. I'll go through all of them and then um, we can take any questions you may have. Uh, first, we have the Health and Welfare Benefit Consulting Services. This award is for our consulting and actuarial services for our employee benefits program. This piggyback award would retain our current provider and maintain the current service rates. Next, printing of school informational calendars. Um, we print the informational calendars each year for the system and for families. This is the bid award for the annual printing. Pr plant operations equipment. This is a procurement buying the list for the year for plant operations or the custodial supplies. Next, we have the supply and installation of security laminate. This bid continue, continues the installation of the security laminate in all of our schools. This is a project uh, that's prioritized by the board's Security Advisory Council, which uh, we've been working on over time. Mm -hmm. For security purposes, we don't publicly share the specific schools and locations. Next, we have combi <laughs> ovens. This award is for the purchase and installation of combi ovens in three schools as part of the ongoing asset renewal in food services. The funding is from the Food Services Program Fund. Next, we have full-size one-ton cargo vans. This is for the purchase of two vans to support the Food Services Program's satellite efforts. Again, the Food Services Program is self-funded. And lastly, we have health and training supplies. This award is for the annual procurement list for supplies for our school health suites. Any questions? Ms. Savigny? Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, I did cross out my questions for the security laminate because we're not giving out no, details. We're not. So never, <laughs> never mind. No, about we're not. That piece. Um, but on the, um, the, the cargo vans, mm -hmm. um, isn't that typically, I, I guess it's because it's for food services mm -hmm. and that they're self-funded through that right. through okay because usually when we're purchasing vans and you know ad additions to the fleet and things like that that happens at the end of the year when we see how much money we have left over um, correct they're they're a self uh, she's a self uh, sustaining fund and so that's part of her operational cost or, or in some places yep. asset costs uh, so it's coming out of that program fund okay. and it's used for the satelliting so we're, we're not cooking in every kitchen um, we're cooking in satellite kitchens or hubs, and then and then moving that um, uh, that food out to other schools within the satellite. That's that's what those are primarily used for. 
Okay. And, and Ms. Arno's done such a fabulous job, and we can't, can't let an opportunity go by to, to recognize that. Mm -hmm. um, but just in terms of I mean, the, it's running the program really well and, like, turning everything over in terms of, um, you know, updates and, and things like that. Um, but we're not planning to – are we planning to increase the cost of, like, school lunches for students? Mm -hmm. She's able to do that within – we are the not, current amount. Yeah. We, we've been very solvent for many years, and actually the pandemic helped in that area. Okay. And it's also allowed her to sort of uh, be a little more aggressive with her renewal program as well. So no, 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 um, no discussion of raising food prices or meal prices. So uh, it's been many, many years since we've talked about that, mm -hmm. in fact. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. All right. I need a motion. Okay. I need a call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now I need a motion for the approval of appointments. So moved. By Ms. Battaglia, seconded by? I'll second it. By Dr. Dorsey. This evening, uh, we have three appointments. The first is Ladina Eames uh, from School Psychologist at, in Baltimore County Public Schools to School Psychologist in Student Services. Next. We have Shakira Murphy, principal at Ev Valley Elementary School, to supervisor of library and media technology curriculum and instruction. And lastly, we have Michael Passan, acting assistant principal at Sykesville Middle, to assistant principal Sykesville Middle. Comments, questions? I call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now I need a motion for the approval of personnel action items. So moved. By, doc, by yeah, Dr. By Ms. Battaglia. <laughs> and seconded by? I'll second. Okay. By Ms. Savigny. For the monthly personnel action items, there is one new hire, one dismissal, one promotion, and three leaves of absence. Seeing no, no comments, I call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Now I need a motion for the approval of transfer of a school bus contract. So moved. So moved by Dr. Dorsey and seconded by Mr. Whistler. This is for the approval of the transfer of one bus contractor to another bus contractor. Any questions? Mm -mm. All right. Seeing no comments, I call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. And now, what we've all been waiting for, may I have a motion for the approval of ratification of Carroll County Education Association CCEA Master Agreement. So moved. By Dr. Dorsey, seconded second. by Ms. Battaglia. <laughs> this year, we had open negotiations with CCEA to arrive at a new master agreement. This year's cycle included the added challenge of arriving at a career ladder as required in the blueprint and looking forward to the salary requirements of the blueprint. I am pleased to share that we have achieved a new master agreement that does accomplish the career ladder and all blueprint salary mandates. The contract is for a three-year term with annual openers for salary and any blueprint specific items. The membership of CCEA has ratified the agreement and now it comes to you for ratification. All right, comments? Seeing none, I call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, it passes unanimously. And seeing that there is no um, there's no unfinished business or new business. Um, we will have our next meeting Wednesday, May 8th, 2024 at 5 p.m. in this board meeting room with public participation at 125 North Court Street, Westminster. I need a motion for adjournment. Mr. Whistler, and I was only 10 minutes off. <laughs> And Ms. Battaglia second the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you all very much.